All right, then. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I apologize that no one can see me because I wish I could see you all as well. Um, but I'd like to say good evening and welcome to this final event for this year's unique annual general meeting of the New York State Horse Council. I'm Karen Lassell, the Northern Regional Vice President for the Horse Council and the Equine Manager at Minor Institute, which is an agricultural education and research facility in the Champlain Valley. I first encountered our guest speakers tonight several years ago when I invited Sharon to present at Equiday, our annual spring seminar. I was hooked. Sharon has taken years of observations and translated the micro movements and expressions that horses have with each other and made these more accessible to us on a day-to-day -day basis. For me personally, it has deepened my connection with the Morgan herd that I work with on a daily basis, but probably even more crucially, it has improved my ability to explain to my students and interns what the horses are telling them and how to begin to answer those questions. I believe that many problems that people encounter with horses stem from a communication gap. Horses thrive in a herd with a good leader and horse speak can help us all to do this from a place of understanding their temperaments, their needs, and it gives us a framework to demonstrate to the horse that we can be trustworthy leaders. So I hope that tonight's presentation inspires you to learn more like it has done for me. And without further ado, Minor Institute is really pleased to sponsor tonight's webinar with Sharon and Laura Wilsey for the New York State Horse Council. Setting up a PowerPoint. Sharon and Laura, you both should be named as presenters, right? I um, sorry about that. We got kicked off for a second. I had um, something got sent to my my computer and it made me restart um, everything. Some system preferences, <laughs> and um, I do not seem to have access to share screen at this time. Okay, hold on one second, and it's I'm gonna send that back over to you. You should be getting that now. Okay. Now, yes. Yeah. All right, there you go. Super. Uh, Sorry about right. that, guys. There we go. Hey, you know, that is the- It uh, happens. All right. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. I did hear most of it before <laughs> we got kicked off. Karen? <laughs> It was, I was like, oh, geez, that's really nice. <laughs> I usually have to introduce myself and it's so weird. So is, can everybody see this? PowerPoint, it says horse speak, nodding. Yeah, looks yes, like we yes. we're good to go. Perfect. No, yes, okay, perfect. So I'm going to take it away then. As soon as we can get this working, click, it needs to click. There. Ah, good, all right. So we're going to begin with talking about the difference between horse speak and training. And can you move those for me, if you don't mind? Thanks. I have, unfortunately, some boxes are covering over. No. Yeah, it's a shame the neck doesn't. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So training is all about shaping behavior. When you're training a horse, you're shaping or molding behaviors that you want. This means that we're giving a cue and we're expecting the horse to remember the answer to that cue and deliver the desired behavior. So that's an oversimplification, but it's basically the essence of what we're looking for in training. We're looking for trained responses. So I do this, you do that. If I, if I move this way, you move that way, et cetera. If I ask for more energy, you give me more energy, but only as much energy as I ask for, not more, not less. So. That is what training does. And it, it's um, been used for thousands of years to help explain to horses the jobs that we want them to do. Okay. So what this is, is a little different. This is communication with horses. Horse speak is not about training, although it can certainly help with training. This is about learning to understand horses in their language, instead of expecting or demanding them to understand ours. This means that we're learning to use our body language to emulate theirs. Horse speak is literally the language system of the horse. 
So let's decode it a little bit. For nearly a decade, I studied the micro movements of horses as they went about their daily lives. The gestures, postures, and signals that horses made to each other were meticulously recorded, documented, and analyzed. Finally, the human version of these body mechanics was developed through experimentation with many horses in a wide variety of situations. So just to elaborate on that a little bit, I would, for instance, um, watch one event happening. Let's say when horses touch muzzles. So then I would say, all right, I can see that they're touching muzzles. And from there, I would expand on that and say, how many ways do they touch muzzles? How many varieties are there? And what's the baseline? When horses touch muzzles, what seems to be the most common reason why they would do it? The most common way that they would do it? And over the course of a day, uh, is there a system to them doing it? Like for instance, if you take one horse out and then bring them back, do they touch muzzles every time or just sometimes? And by, by establishing a baseline, then I could look at the variables along either end of that baseline. So I could say, well, here's a, an intense, worried horse. Do they have a, a higher frequency of muzzle touching or a lower frequency? Here's a, um, a nervous horse that's really timid and almost stands by themselves. If they're offered muzzle touch, do they seek it or do they move away from it? So things like that. So I start with a basic premise. I see how often is it happening? What are they doing when it happened? What came before it? What came after it? What did it seem to be in response to? What kind of message in the herd did it seem to generate? And then, most importantly, could I do it? And if I was going to do it, what were the variables to me doing it? And could I be in that baseline with most horses, so that average zone? And then what if I was meeting a horse who was all the way at one end or all the way at the other end? What kind of variables could I add to that to possibly entice the horse to do muzzle touch with me if I'm thinking that that is going to help me gain rapport with that horse? So that's what I mean by really analyzing the micro gestures of horses. And over a long period of time, I was able to um, go through a, a wide variety of these gestures, postures, and signals make a record of all of them, all the variations, and all the um, the average greeting ritual, uh, sorry, the average greeting ritual is one of the things, the average gestures, postures, and signals that they did so that I could anticipate, I could um, educate, and mostly so that I could reach whatever horse was in front of me, but also so that I could teach people and so that's where this this really expanded and, and really took off into what I now call horse speak. So learning to listen is the keynote. By watching what horses do and when they do it, I was able to piece together a cohesive system. Using horse speak means a person can learn how to not only imitate their language, but also how to send a clear message of leadership to a horse just from the way you approach them. So literally, Things that you're doing with your body position, with your gesture, with your postures, with other subtle signals can influence a sense of calm, a sense of connection. You could take a high headed horse and help them get low headed or a horse who's apprehensive and doesn't want to come to you and generate interest. So just by understanding um, how to emulate their body language, it proved to be incredibly useful and practical. So what are the benefits? Understanding not only how horses communicate in micro gestures, but also what it is that they most often quote talk about is important in building rapport. So better rapport helps build trust, confidence, and safety. Understanding how they perceive the world can aid us in keeping their attention tuned into us instead of the many distractions in the environment. And anyone who's worked with horses for any length of time knows that that is one of the keynotes in being able to train a horse. You want to be able to keep their focus on you if you want them to learn the lesson. And so one of the things that started to really appeal to me as I learned more and more from the horses about this language system was that a little bit of horse speak went a long way in generating that interest and that sense of trust the reason why a horse will keep paying attention to you is because you're valuable. You have something to say that adds value 
to them and to their environment. So for instance, you can help a horse see you as a protector. So horse herds have many roles, and one of those roles is the sentry. When you learn how to play the sentry for your horse, they listen to your opinion about whether or not something is spooky. In a healthy herd, and I say healthy herd because there can be herds of horses that are all stressed out and then it's difficult for them to really adjust and find uh, a healthy role to play if, if a lot of the horses in that herd are having a difficult time and are stressed out. So in a healthy herd, there's primarily one sentry that makes the decision to either run away or ignore a suspicious thing. If you are that sentry, then you're the one to make that decision. And so there's actions you can take to demonstrate that you're the sentry. And there's also breath messages you can make to demonstrate not only the sentry, but also say things like, all's clear, you're safe, stay with me. So these are really important things because as we all know, spookiness is one of the top challenges in working with horses. Sure. But there's a lot more roles in the herd. So a healthy herd has a wide variety of roles. And th there's quite a list, so I just made a few here. For instance, there's a map maker. So that's number one. If you look up on your screen, you'll see the map maker. Number two is the protector. And I'm playing that role for this herd. I'm all the way in the back with my palm in the air and I have the rear guard for this little herd. There's a mentor and that in this case happens to be the horse in the middle. He is the most steady. If you look at him, he's lined up perfectly along the wall. He's got a nice spacing between the map maker and number four, who's the joker. And the joker doesn't have his feet together at all because jokers are always ready to go. They like to open doors and see what's over there and take things in their mouth and play with them. And they're just kind of known for getting into things. They can usually be, you know, a bit fun to be with, but also a little bit of a challenge. So sure. I had, in this case, gone to the Joker to offer my protector role, which not only applied to the Joker, but to the whole herd. But when I did that, the horses in the front were able to square up their front legs and get calm because I was going to hold the position for the Joker, who didn't bother to square up his legs because he was always ready to go. <laughs> but just understanding how horses might play a different role can help people in like a lineup. So I, I got a message from someone who runs a trail riding facility and they were saying, you know, I just have this problem. These, all these horses know their job, but I just, it's always a challenge. And so we went through the list and the, uh, and when I realized, you know, she had the horses in the wrong order. So when she explained to me their personalities and what they typically did, I said, well, you know, that horse, put that horse in front and put this horse behind and then put those two in the middle. And so she went and did her trail ride and she called me the next day and said, oh my God, that worked. How did you know that? <laughs> and I just said, well, you had the map maker in the protector role and the joker was out in front. So that's never gonna work out. <laughs> so just understanding some things about the roles that they play and in the level of, of positioning, even what horse is stalled next to what horse or what horse do you turn out with what horse? Like it can really help to sort of understand the roles in the herd. So let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of horse speak. In other words, how to speak horse. So the first thing I always work on with people is something I call finding zero. So when horses feel calmer, they tend to remain in more of an O posture. We'll get into that more in a moment. Happy horses prefer to feel calm. We call this inner calm being zero. Finding zero helps you and your horse to have better rapport. So what that really means is that the horse is able to get out of the sympathetic nervous system and drop into the parasympathetic. That's one way to look at it. They're able to achieve homeostasis. That's another way to look at it. But basically they feel safe and they feel that because you're in their world, they can lean on you and trust in your judgment. And so that takes a load off of their shoulders and it makes them feel like, okay, now I can pay attention to what it is you wanted me to do because I'm not worried about you know, lions and tigers and boogeymen, okay? So when we're helping a horse find zero, that means we have a responsibility to try to be zero as well. And that's usually where I get the most emails, Sharon, how do I find zero? So 
Uh, there's a couple of quick tips I have for that. One is to take your fingers, put them together like this and rest with your palms up. And just by doing that activity, you find that your body wants to take a breath. And that's because doing this is a signal. The only reason you would do this is because nothing is dangerous, right? So normally if we're feeling tense, we tend to do this and we don't even realize it, or we do this, or we do this. There's things that we do that we get a defensive posture. So when you have an open posture, it signals your brain to say, probably I'm okay. So it's it um, helps you to take a deeper breath. Another thing is to realize that the, the, um, the look on your face can be sending a message. So a lot of times when we're concentrating, we make an intense face. We kind of, you know, I'm just, I'm writing something down and I, I'm not feeling angry. I'm not feeling upset, but it's something that we've learned to do. We kind of squeeze our faces and, um, or we're re remembering something and we, we get this squinched up face. So just pay attention. Is my face kind of squinched up and tense right now? Because if it is, then the horse doesn't know why your face looks like that, but they know that that's a sign of tension and they don't know why you're tense. And so they're very direct, right? And so if you're my leader and you're tense, there must be a tiger somewhere, right? So it's it's a pretty simple thing if you're a horse. It's like, if if this, then that. So if you show up and you're tense and you could be tense about the horse, you could be like, last time I was here, you stepped on my foot. But that's not how they see it. They're just like, you're my leader because you put me on a lead rope, because you tell me where to be, because you give me hay or not, things like that. So if you're my leader and you look tense, there must be something to be tense about. So it's really important for us to just take that extra time to put, to take some deep breaths, listen to some happy music, whatever your special thing is that helps you feel calm. And when you notice that you've started to lose it, you've started to get tight again, you're not breathing deep, your face has got that look again, just take a moment and be, put your fingers together, take a breath and go back to zero. And even if you have to remind yourself 20 times, that's okay. When you're demonstrating a return to zero in front of your horse, the message you're sending them is this is more important than anything else. And if that's what you're saying, then you're taking on the affect of a mentor. So mentor horses are great at going back to zero as quickly as possible. And they move in heavy, slow, predictable ways. And they have a lot of low, relaxing postures. They take a lot of deep breaths. And by doing that, they send a message out to the whole herd. It's okay, it's time to relax. So just by making an effort to be more zero around your horse, you're saying to them, you know, zero is really important to me. And when they see that, they're gonna realize, oh, you wanna go to zero, great, because that's actually what horses want too. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the basic postures. So X and O, so X posture can mean things like alarm or alert. It could represent fear or just energy. It can be intensity. And it also often has reactivity connected to it. O posture tends to mean connection. It's a lowering of intensity. It can be a message of all's well or all's clear, like whew, that's over. It can signal relaxation or a time to relax. So you'll see horses starting to go into an O when it's time to take a nap. And it's the posture that's more likely to have responsiveness in it. So if you have a high headed reactive horse, if their energy is going, their adrenaline is going, they're in a reactive, you know, uh, either in fight or flight or on the edge of that mode, that is not the brain that you want for learning. When they're in a lower O posture, they can calm themselves down. They can think better. And I'll tell you, when horses are thinking and processing, it has to go all the way through their body. So, they have to allow um, information to come in and move through. And when you get used to seeing it, you'll actually see it's like a wave. And when they get finished with a whole thought, you'll see like the pelvis moves, they cock a hip or they flick their tail a little bit. And that's them kind of going, oh, I think I get it. Now it's a big body, so it can take them a full minute to actually process if the information is 
something that they have to really consider. But the more you allow them to process all the way through, the more O posture you get. And the more those two things happen, the more they can memorize what that was all about. So the next time it happens, all they have to do is go, what was that? Oh yeah, that was that thing. Here you go. And they like to please us. And they also like to, to, to anticipate and to know what's coming. And horses do a lot of practicing with each other. So when you give them a chance to process, they're much more likely not only to remember what it was, but to deliver it with some, with some pride or some gusto. Once they've like, oh, I know what this is. I got, I got the answer to this. Instead of a cue that then we push and we say, give me the response, that puts them into some kind of X. And they're like, oh, I got, I, uh, uh, now I'm getting stressed. So stress does not allow for learning. So that's really what the, the, big, the big deal about the two postures is. And again, we can go into X, which is not only your hands, but also your feet, your intensity levels, and we can go into O. And X could be a driving posture. When you're lunging, you're in X. And O can be a welcoming posture, come to me, or it could be just a calming posture. So there's a lot of varieties <laughs> to these two postures, but the baseline is what's important. And then think about it. Are you an X person or an O person? And if you're not sure, you should probably ask somebody else because they'll know. <laughs> and what's funny about that is we have a lot of people say, oh, I am definitely an O person. And everyone around is going, no, you're not, <laughs> okay? Or someone else is like, I'm just 2X, no, you're not. So sometimes our self-assessment is not as accurate. So this is a fun thing to do at parties, right? Are you an X or an O? Or a Zoom call. Or a Zoom call, <laughs> yeah. So another thing, bubble of personal space. The bubble mm -hmm. of personal space is more important to horses than nearly anything else. And that's because if their bubble is encroached upon, they do not feel that they can escape from danger. Establishing my space, your space is a crucial element to helping horses feel relaxed, comfortable, and trusting in your leadership. Now, most horses are more than willing to do the my space, your space interaction because they're actually seeking it. Horses do this with each other all the time. And when you notice horses hanging out together, very seldom do you see them touching. Really good buddies, you might see them grooming and they might have their regular grooming session. But most horses, when they're relaxed and comfortable, they're standing close enough, but also there's some distance. And then they're going into like a, a nap, right? Or they're happily grazing together. So when horses are comfortable with each other, there's connection and there's respect and it's inherent. So one of the things for us to practice is just saying, I know I've got hands and I want to use them and I can't wait to pat my horse, but if you can find the edge of the bubble, almost like a mime, you know, find the edge of the bubble. And if you have one of those joker horses who's like, I don't believe in bubbles, right? <laughs> you might have to be like, in my space, your space, a little bit. But most horses, when you say, okay, here's the edge of the bubble. Oh, yeah. You know, I have a, I, I can kind of feel that. Like when I step closer, the horse's head lifts a little. They look at me funny. And when I step further away, they relax and they let their breath out. Huh, how interesting. Just by finding the edge of the bubble, you're saying, I'm aware of your need for safety and having your own bubble of personal space. So that is a really, really important part of learning to speak horse. Pardon me. Sorry about that. We have someone at the door all of a sudden. So now we're going to talk about one of the more important aspects of speaking horse, which is the buttons of horse speak. Now, originally I started out with 13 buttons and with the new book coming out, I've moved it up to 15. There was two other buttons, one at the bridge of the nose and one at the sit button, which is at the, uh, the back of the rump down where it's leading towards the hawk. And I included these buttons in this book because I wanted time to explore how to teach those buttons to people before I, I had put them into the first book. Because I feel like they're very sensitive and I didn't want people just grabbing onto them and doing things that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure. So now I'm, I, I figured out how to really teach those two buttons and so I'm including it. So the 15 buttons of horse speak are simply the interactive areas that horses use along their body for communication. Each button has a specific meaning and combined with gestures and postures, the buttons help horses express precise intentions, 
emotions, wants, and needs, as well as expressing fears, mutual protection or support, nurturing, and even conflict resolution. So all of the social order needs that horses have with each other are fulfilled by aiming and displaying buttons along their body as they're communicating with each other. And the fascinating thing about this is that if you have five horses together, they can all be chatting at the same time. And you'll literally, we put um, like, we would like paint spots on horses and then turn them loose together. And then, and people are going, it's happening. It's, he just aimed his, his belly button at that horse's nose button and the horse put his nose on it. It's real. You know, so I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> so when we learn where the buttons are in the baseline of what they mean, you can then combine that while well, the horse is in X and they're displaying their shoulder or the horse is in O and they're displaying their neck. Those can mean two different things, even though the button has a baseline meaning. So this is a really interesting system and, and it goes pretty deep. But once you kind of get the hang of it, your horse is just moving around you being like, hi, how are you doing? It's, you know, I'm feeling a little vulnerable. How are you feeling? Oh, you're feeling better now? Good. So <laughs> there's all this really interesting stuff that's going on. And honestly, I think you agree with me. Horses are never not talking. That's true. They're like me. They just go on and on. And <laughs> that's why you're the horse speaker. Because I just I can't stop. I can't stop. So the chessboard, this is a, an aspect to horse speak. So horses perceive every area of their lives like a chessboard. Each space has potential for a safety spot as well as a possible spooky corner. Horses are not only navigating each new chessboard, but also all the other beings or objects on the board with them. You can help your horse by making safety objects on the chessboard for them to feel comfortable. Each time we move a horse, every threshold is an entrance to a new chessboard. So even if the horse goes up and down that aisle every day, he's in the here and now. So horses don't project into next Tuesday. They're always in the here and now. Prey animals need to be in the here and now, not distracted thinking about, you know, the bone I buried in the backyard like a dog. They're in the here and now because if a predator was to show up and something bad was to happen, they need to decide now what they're gonna do about it. So every chessboard for them is something that has to be navigated. So they don't just go into the riding arena and go, oh, it's the riding arena, it's fine. That day, every new day, they wanna see, but did, you know, did a cat walk through here? Was there a bear? I mean, I we actually had someone write to us because they said they were going into the barn in the morning and the horses were sweaty. They didn't know why. So they put in a motion control camera and it turns out at three in the morning, a big black bear was walking right down the middle of the barn. So, you know, I mean, it's pretty crazy. So just because we didn't see it happen doesn't mean something didn't go through or go by. Or I've known a lot of horses who um, go to a corner and, and kind of sniff and, and linger. And, and someone says, oh, you know, there was a there was a bad accident in that corner. Uh, you know, six months ago, and that's even before this horse came to this barn. And that's happened so many times that I think that there's maybe a pheromone imprint or or something that's happening in, in those areas. We know now that horses can smell almost as good as a dog can. So uh, I met someone out west who was <clears throat> training horses to um, scent uh, missing people and and i think it was the rocky mountains right so the horses were finding like smelling and finding lost people so it's not impossible that there's some kind of aroma that gets left from that kind of stress and they can pick up on it whatever it is when we are thinking that to them this is a chessboard they're a prey animal every time they're on a new chessboard they need to check it out they need to see where's where's my safety place, where is the spooky corner, uh, where do resources happen, and and how do I navigate this chessboard? And until they've had a chance to do that, they're just not going to be zero inside. And some horses can manage that better than others. Some are like, you know, I can, you know, they're a mentor or they're, you know, they're a sentry, and so they're kind of okay. They can look around a little bit and figure it out. And some horses 
have a lot more nerves and they're like, I really can't do this without your help. So just thinking in that way can really help us to set up their reality to be more of what we're really looking for. So we want them to pay attention to us and learn the lesson instead of worry about the chessboard. So now let's talk a little bit about gestures, postures, and signals. Even though our body structure is shaped totally different from them, we can use our arms and hands and even our feet to send clear messages. We can also use our X and O to model the postures of alert or all's well, like that. Combining this with the buttons and the bubble, we can create clear signals to horses that help them to trust our leadership and offer them a secure environment while they're with us. In that way, instead of correcting horses for doing behaviors that we don't like or that are you know, difficult to deal with, we're actually solving the reason why the behavior is showing up in the first place. And we've had so many sessions with horses that have had, a, you know, one, the, the Frisian, we were at the Frisian place and there was this horse and she, the stallion, and she'd been riding him for years. And just, no matter what she did, she just couldn't get him over this fear. And, and we just did a whole session of horse speak and then went on to the arena and then did some session out there of horse speak. And he just went, looked at us and said, thanks. And then offered to do the activity that she'd always wanted to do, which was some, you know, collection, collected canners and things like that. And he would just get really strung out and couldn't do it. And now he's offering it and he's doing it and it's no problem at all because it wasn't that he was just being spooky. It was that he needed someone, he's the type of horse mm -hmm. that needed someone to say, I've got your back. I'm going to help you sort out this chessboard. So that leads us to this, perfect. I've got your back, <laughs> try this at home. So horses send this message by offering a protection from behind to a buddy. So you'll see like a mentor, a protector, a sentry, you know, that kind of horse. Often they'll opt to put their chin on the rump of another horse and just rest there for a moment. Sometimes they might rub the side of their face along the rump or, or even put their forehead and they just kind of do this a little bit. They might even just aim their eyes and breathe deeply looking at another horse's rump. So this is a very different message than when a horse is driving another horse forward. And you might have horses driving each other forward because there's a bully in the herd or because there's something panicky and they're feeling <clears throat> nervous and need to get out of the way. But when I was studying horses, I was really trying to watch the horses that weren't doing much. I was watching them eat and move a few feet and then eat some more and move, move a few feet, etc., for hours and hours and hours, because that's where the primary conversations are actually having. So all of that big stuff that you see, running and jumping and leaping, blah, 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 you can't read that. It's too fast and it's too much. I mean, I can read it now, but in the beginning, it's too many things happening. But if you see them take a step, look like this, cock an ear, do a tail swish, take a breath, take another step. That was a whole sequence of messages. That's easy enough to follow. So when I'm suggesting that you try this, it's really the feeling that you would have in putting your arm around someone and saying, I've got your back. It's that same expression that we want to be creating for them. So if you have a horse who you trust and you can rest your palm on their hip, then that's great. But if you have a horse that you're not sure they're going to accept that or you're not sure if you're ready for that, you can send this message from a distance. So in the in the image below, I'm on the other side of a pen and I've got my palm in the air and I'm sending that message. This horse was really, really nervous. It was his first time off the farm. He was a young horse and he was just bouncing and running all over the place. And after I sent this message, which is 20 seconds in the air, breathing deeply, and it's, I've got your back. He turned around and he came to me and everything after that was O posture. So I always say safety first. If you're not sure, send the message in the air. Horses get the message, whether you're touching them or not. In fact, some horses prefer it if you just put the message in the air. But it's a really great thing to offer to your relationship with a horse. Now, if you have a protector, you might say, I've got your back. And the protector goes, 
not. Sure you do. <laughs> but, but it's still nice to offer it. You know, sometimes they'll do like a little ear twiggle or a little tail swish. Like, that's cute. That's, well, that's fun. And then in the lower corner picture on the left side, as I'm looking at the screen, that is just a great, if the context of that picture is <laughs> that this horse was loose in an arena. It was a quite a large arena by herself. And Sharon was doing gestures, postures, and signals from outside the barrier. It was basically like a, barrier it was like a hockey rink type, yep. type situation. That's why I'm so high. Yeah. And she literally backed up to Sharon. Because I because I was doing this. The hold hand. She backed up yeah. to it. And when I put my hand there, she she started to lower her head and go, oh, posture, lick and chew. Mm -hmm. And she lingered. And she stayed there and, and stayed there, there and like stayed there. And there like 30 other people along the front row. But mm -hmm. the horse lined up with Sharon because she was the one who was presenting and talking and doing all the postures and signals. And she was like. Oh, you're going to protect me? Great. I'm backing right in. And then when the other horse came in after, mm -hmm. she they did their whole horse greeting and they needed to do all their horsey things. And then she brought him over to me and encouraged him to back around. She's like, that lady's got your back. You need to try it. It's great. And so I did it to him and he was looking at her like, I ain't never seen such a thing. She's like, I know, right? This is awesome. And I was able to go down into the arena with them and they followed me around and we did lovely circles and arcs and we moved around in this beautiful way, walk, truck, canter. And it was really easy, and quiet and super duper friendly because we were able to do this message. And of course, uh, the next message that's really important that you can also try at home is how to say hello. So they greet through the muzzle. But often after you have a nice greeting, you'll have a horse quietly turn around and present the hip like that. And they're saying, do you have my back too? And this is completely different than a defensive horse with the ears pinned, big X posture, big gesture, with the tail clamped and they're, and they're hunkering down and they're like, I'm defensive. That's not that message at all. They, they greet you and then they turn around nice and slow and they sort of offer and they're like, do you have my back? And it's a totally different feeling. So when you try the greeting at home, you're gonna stay a little bit outside the bubble, but I don't wanna see this. Hi. Hi. Okay, that's too close. <laughs> and the horse will tell you, and you know, you don't wanna be that close to their face. They could bonk you and, and things like that. The bubble is really important. Offer a low O posture to signal you want a calm, quiet greeting. So when horses come in and they want to keep it cool, they'll really drop their head and neck and try to get a low muzzle touch with each other. Offer the back of your knuckles because open palm means food and it inspires them to lick or even to nibble. So I don't like people to greet this way because horses don't lick when they're greeting. They lick because there's food. So I don't want to inspire that. You do it this way and it simulates a muzzle. And sometimes you'll even have horses like if you have your fingers like this, you have a little pretend nostril here and a little pretend nostril there. And some horses will put their nostril right on it and go, you got a nostril? And they'll breathe, it's really funny. So I will, if they do that, I'm breathing nice and deep. But when you just do your greeting, you're just going, like you'd say, hi to someone. And you could just say, hi there or hello. But once you've done it, then you need to stand up and stop. Otherwise, it's the same sort of social mistake as shaking someone's hand and shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking, and shaking until, Alice. yes, and Alice will get very upset. Okay, so don't do that. So you, you do a touch, hi, nice to meet you, and then you stand up and you're done. Now, there's a whole system to the greeting. It's actually an entire ritual, and I, and I teach that in, in the books and webinars and things like that. But for this, for this thing, just try this because it means hi there and later on if a horse brings their head towards you they're wanting to do what's called a check-in which more is more demonstrated in this photo as more of a check-in yes because the this other is photo, from the side yeah but you mm -hmm. want to be right chest on chest when for generally for an, a beginning greeting for like the first time of the day or the first time you've ever tried it it's just like greeting a person where you're kind of eyes on eyes front on front but because uh, you wouldn't greet like this. Hi, nice to meet you. That's kind of weird. But you might later go, hey, how are you feeling? And that's a check-in and it's from the side. So it's the same rules apply. But don't worry about it too much. If you offer your knuckle and your horse wants to sniff you, that's good. 
-hmm. Just remember, if you've offered your knuckle and they bring their face around, they're usually saying, can you check in again? And if you don't notice, they might come all the way in and start sniffing your pockets, sniffing you, because what they're saying is, if I need to check in with you, what part of your body am I supposed to check in with? So I say always and only this. I don't want a horse in my pockets. I don't want them sniffing my face. I don't want them pulling on my coat. I just hear, this is a place to land. This is the landing pad. And some horses are really insecure and they wanna check in all the time. They're like, are we okay? Are we okay? Are we okay? And some are really sweet and they're like, I'm having a nice time. And so there's different reasons why they would do the check-in, but just keep that in mind. So here's a troubleshooting idea. We have, let's say an overexcited horse. So this is a group of horses I had just met. So there, there's no previous conditioning, there's nothing. I just went in, I greeted, I did the very quick bump, my space, your space bubble, which goes to the cheek button. And I walked into the whole crowd of horses, now I'm walking out and I'm doing this. Okay, so this is a hand gesture. That means my space, your space. My palms are down because palm down, calm down, all right? And I have enough X in my posture to say, I'm walking here, but enough O in my posture to say, and you know, we're fine, everything's fine. So by doing that, the horses literally cleared the path, dropped their heads, moved over, acknowledged my bubble, were happy to give me space. This one horse is actually stepping out of the way. So offer your hold hand to the buttons to tell them that you're gonna watch out for them. It's a really important part of troubleshooting an overexcited horse. So like if, if I have my hand here and I say, I want you to respect my space, and then I just kind of put my hand away, that says to the horse, I'm all done. I'm all done with the bubble. And they're gonna say, really? Okay, I'm gonna come back in. So if you have an overexcited horse, you might need to just walk around like this for a couple of days until you get used to defining your bubble and they get used to seeing you define your bubble. And then what tends to happen is they go, oh, well, you always have a bubble. Okay, otherwise this looks like X and putting your hands away looks like O, which they think is come back. Okay, so that's a simple thing for us to think about. Just one thing you can add that can help the overexcited horse to just give you some space. So here's another troubleshooting, the hesitant horse. So this was the group that had only been in the arena for maybe five minutes. And these are a lot of typically high-headed horses. And what we're doing is called secure the environment. So everyone had been walking along the wall and touching the wall, so human touching the wall. You can do this on any, any space you're in. This happens to be an indoor. You can do this in a round pen. You can do this in an outdoor arena. You can do this along the trail. You can do this in any place. But what's important is the human has to touch the wall first, not the horse. And there's an important reason for that. When you have um, mama horses, they have their little babies, they're gonna go and touch things and, and check it out. Is there a bee, is there a beehive? Are there bears walking around out here? Are there just boogeymen in general? And so they're gonna be protective and sniff the things before they let the baby go there. So that's just an oversimplification, but just it starts there. And then when, you, when the horses become adults, you have those members of the herd that take the outside track. So when you turn horses loose in a new space, and you watch, you'll see there's always that one horse that goes and touches the walls and the other horses kind of hang back and watch and see, are there bees, are there bears, are there boogeymen? And they let that horse check and inspect the environment. And when that horse says, okay, this, this spot here is nice and safe, then they'll linger there. They'll like almost take a nap there. They, I've even seen horses leave their nose on, on a wall, just leave it there and kind of walk, this is a good place, guys. <laughs> this spot on the walls, okay. And the other horses will eventually come over and want to touch the same spot. Another thing that they do to make a safety object or a safety spot for themselves is to make a pile of poop. So they can make a stress poop when they're like running and the poop's shooting out, but they make a safety poop when they feel really relaxed, take a big breath, 
and they they plop it right there and that's the kind of poop that they'll come back and sniff over and over and over again and if you remove it they get all frustrated and they want to go back and make another one because they had just said that was a safe place and you moved their safety object so in lieu of having to have poops for safety um, you can put down a cone a barrel you know any object the mounting block anything or just the wall itself you can go to one of the letters on the wall and you can say oh, this is a safe place to be and you just rest there for count to 20 right 20 seconds is pretty good blink you know chew some gum relax your neck and shoulders relax your back a lot of times we're very kind of stiff around horses but the more you sort of relax your neck you're saying to them relax your neck because you can't say hey horse relax your neck but you can say this <laughs> and it means the same thing and then the horse will say oh really oh time to relax my neck okay and they start doing those things <laughs> so by making a safety object you've said all's clear everything's good this is a safe place to be and don't try to make your safety object in the spooky corner <laughs> that's i mean eventually you can get there but make your safety object in the area that the horse already feels safe and just and amplify the safety and then increase the bubble of safety till eventually if you have a cone maybe you pick up the cone and you bring it over to the spooky area and you drop the cone and say let's make this spooky area feel safer but you can't start in the in the high intensity zone you need to start where it's already working and then bring it that way but this is such a powerful tool that um, within minutes, all of these horses are like licking and chewing and getting heavy. And I, they all started taking naps, as a matter of fact. So, and most of these owners are like, I've never seen my horse even, I didn't even know the head went down. I thought they just were a high headed horse, period, the end. So this is a really amazing and simple activity to do. And if it's just part of your uh, resume, if it's just part of what you do with your horse, they, they remember day to day to day that you're always there for them. And this really helps them to just let a lot of that stuff go. So gaining your horse's interest, offering even a few simple signals of horse speak is usually enough to have a horse really take notice. Some horses are teachers and this type will often start to help you learn. So you'll be doing a greeting and then they'll look at you and say, what's next? And then they might start looking away. It's my cheek. That's the next button. It's my cheek. And you touch the cheek and they go, oh, yes, very good human, right? So there, I like those horses. Remember, you're not teaching horse speak. Horses already know it, it's their language. You are learning horse speak for yourself and hopefully you're having some fun in the process. So the big goal of this is rapport. When horses feel understood, many of their usual concerns melt away. If rapport is your goal, so every day rapport is my goal, then everything else that you do with your horse is that much sweeter and when you show up all good things come with you so even if you're like oh i want to get this done or get that done or get this done i want to get this done with rapport i want to get this done with zero the more that that is um, what you keep in the back of your mind the more the horse says yeah me too and then you really really have a willing partner that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Other, can I do questions? It's Sarah Go. She is the keeper of the questions. She is. <laughs> uh oh, I don't see Sarah. Where'd she go? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Don't worry. Hey. Oh, there you are. All right. Thank All right, you. does anybody have any questions for today to type in the chat? When is the book going to come out? <laughs> well, the, so the, the first book is called Horse Speak. That came out 2016. The second book is Horses in Translation. That came out uh, after that. And the third book will be out in January. January. Yeah. Woo! Yes. yes. And we also have a DVD called First Conversations. Yes. So if you go to um, Judy, Sharon, 
SharonWilsey.com. That's our website, and we offer webinars, and we have a monthly club, we um, or a weekly club meeting that we go live with our members, and um, we have them send in their videos, and we do we an, analyze we them. analyze them, and whether it's herd communications or people are practicing horse speak with their horses, and we give them some feedback. So it's really fun. It's really fun. A lot of different ways to uh, check out horse speak. And you can check out Amazon too, because all the stuff is on there as well. Judy, you have your hand up. I do. <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. Um, I have a, a Morgan mare. Um, I've had her for seven years. Um, when I got her, she had issues with bridling. And we got over that. With saddling, we got over that. With brushing, we got over that. And now her issue is when I go to saddle her again or brush her again. Um, she's wicked. She kicks and, and, you know, um, I had a couple people come and we adjusted the saddle, the breast collar, cause she's round, um, pads so that it's not, you know, um, bothering her shoulders. And we were pretty confident that this was comfortable once I get the saddle on and get on her. She's perfect. We have a great ride. We, she loves to trot. We do a lot of trotting and exercising. Um, but it's like ever since I've gotten her, she has an issue. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, it, it's kind of funny. Everyone who sees her thinks she's a gelding. Mm. She's got a big chest. She's got a big neck. Um, my, my dentist that comes, kept calling her a he and I said she's a she mm -hmm. um, you know so maybe she's got a little extra testosterone or something in there um, she can be very sweet but um, now her issue is saddling and I, I literally have to put my helmet on while I'm putting the saddle on her because she's swift with her hind feet kicking mm. but again once I get the saddle on and you know we, we start to ride she's perfect she's calm and she's wonderful yeah so you know that's if if i was meeting your horse <laughs> i would start at the beginning of you know what kind of bubble does she have what kind of need for space does she have and what is she looking for from the relationship with the human in other words is she looking for resources like some horses are really just resources are the most important thing to me you know where's the water where's the hay where's the the thing i need they're looking for protection some horses are, get very lucky off to the distance and that's the way of saying i actually don't feel very protected so i'm looking for more protection uh are they looking for connection and comfort so those are the horses who seem really sweet and they just kind of crawl up and they're like you know i want to be close to you or are they looking for Hi. Looking, looking for, for the, the dogs and cats fighting for, for Alice. Are they looking for the spatial awareness? So yeah. some horses are just so sensitive, especially those Morgan mares. I have two, and they're so <laughs> hyper aware of their space and this perceived infraction that I stepped too close. Yeah, I'm an inch too close now, and they're like, "How dare you!" Don't you yeah. know that's my bubble? And so sometimes the, some horses are just like, I need to know you can see my bubble all the time. And some horses, like it's like they don't even have a bubble. They're like, whatever, you can do whatever you want. But these hot and cold running mood swing Morgans, I have two of them. And, you know, a bubble needs seem to be more profound yeah. for my two girls. And really emphasizing the my space, your space. Mm -hmm. and lingering longer on the outside of the bubble and making more O postures, saying, you come into my bubble, you come to me when you're ready, or you give me the signal that it's time to start <coughs> crossing the bubble. Because just like with us, if we're a little bit, if you know, if I'm a little sensitive or I, I'm talking to someone and they want to hug me, but maybe I don't want to hug, right? Um, if a person says, do you mind if I hug you? I'm much more likely to say, sure. But if they just come on over like, I'm a hugger, you have to deal with it, right? Then I'm like, oh, not okay, go away now. So that's the best way I can put it. And so I would have to meet your 
course to know what is the thing that she's craving the most. But what you can do is define the edge of that bubble more precisely and kind of have an open, open-minded open question about, geez, you know, what do, I can offer protection. I can look in the distance and say, is there a boogeyman over there? I can touch the fence line and look for bees. I can do these kinds of activities. Um, I can hold space. I'm just going to stand here and define the space. That's the palm up like this. Mm-hmm. I can make an old posture and say, you come to me when mm-hmm. you're ready. Let me know when you feel better. So you can do some of these activities with her to figure out what it is that she's looking for. And the reason I'm saying the bubble is because that's where it's going to show up. The the fussy, fussy energy that by the time saddling happens is like over the top in a red zone. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when you can sort, when you can start there, start like at the beginning, start where horses start and then work your way in. You'll find that she's been, she's giving a lot of other messages along the way that most of us just, I didn't know either. I had lots, I had a million and one saddling, how to get a saddle on your horse tips and tricks. But when I understood the bubble, I was like, oh. And taking more time. Yeah. And watching her, you know, whether ears, her head goes up, her eyes, her mouth, like all these little nuances, whether her girth is, you know, we call it a twiggle. Um, And also maybe adding a little more breath into Mm -hmm. what you're doing. So when you, and doing long, low strokes, with the grooming um, and then even approaching her like having her greet the saddle and breathe in this linger and see what she even thinks of it being in front of her and just kind of you know kind of rebuilding the start of saddling right so what, what we're saying is it's, it's not just like a trick or a gimmick to so my horse will let me put the saddle on you're actually having a conversation with her on the outside of her bubble about being ready so you want her to start to come to zero and she may never like it. That's okay. She doesn't have to like it, but she needs to have, let's say if there's red light, green light, she needs to have a bigger yellow, a bigger tolerance. And the only way she's going to build that tolerance is if we can linger on the edge of the bubble. And I've taken an afternoon and taken like an hour or so with a horse who's really, really fussy and just said, I'm going to linger. I'm going to get a really old, cheap saddle that doesn't weigh much so I can do this and doesn't make me exhausted. And <laughs> And I'm going to linger on the edge of your bubble and I'm going to look for little signs that you're developing your ability to allow this to happen. So when I call it building a better yellow zone, okay? So instead of just putting the saddle on, I want the horse to put the saddle on themselves. I, I was doing this in Germany in front of like 50 people in a crowd and part of me was like, I hope this really, you know, I hope at some point the horse says yes. <laughs> and it only took about 20 minutes and literally the horse came up to the saddle and slipped underneath it. So, so being on the edge of the bubble and saying, let me really, really get this straight. So you've got a big bubble and you have some kind of issue with the saddle. And I think the saddle fits you yada, 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 but you've got some kind of thing so I really am interested in a conversation with you about what it would take for you to find some yellow. And if I have a, a horse that's that fussy, I might do five minutes, see if I get a little bit, a little bit better, and then drop the subject, walk away, come back and do another five and drop the subject, come back, do another five. I might repeat it, give a lot of breaks in between because I want the horse to say, I have agency. Because if I just trick the horse into putting the saddle on, I can use treats and I can use this and I can use that. And there's all kinds of things you can do. But ultimately, some horses really need to feel that they have agency to come to yes. Does that make sense? I mean, like in their power. Yeah. 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 I, I think she's I think she's very um, independent and very assertive. You know, it's like with the grooming. Yeah, you know she yeah. hates it. Yeah, and I'll so again, try. So here's here's an interesting thing. If you work on the outside of the bubble for a lot longer, then by the, see by the time you get to grooming, you're in the bubble. You're way yeah. inside the bubble. See what I'm okay. saying? So you're yeah. so you're, we all of us, not you, humans. This is what we do. I did it too. Is there's a a gazillion little signs they're giving on the outside of the bubble. 
that by the time we've missed all those signs and we're we're popping the bubble and we're in there and we're doing things, they're like, I've been telling you, I gave you like 50 signals. And at this point, you had it. Right. So if we if we just step back and go to the edge of the bubble and say, all right, I'm really interested in learning your signs. Because sometimes these Morgans, honestly, they're fast talkers. So they're like, flick it, lick it, thick it, thick it, thick it, thick it. You get it? Yeah. <laughs> You're, yeah, that's what we're, I'm like, slow it down, because I only get half of what you just said. I don't know. So it, by being willing mm -hmm. to stay on the outside of the bubble and kind of, what do you perceive? What do you feel? At what point do you start to get butterflies in your tummy? Like, I've had people say, oh, my God, I took a step closer, and I got butterflies in my tummy. I didn't realize that was happening to me. Because we're used to ignoring it and just kind of going ahead. But if I've got butterflies in my tummy, I don't have zero. So how can I give my horse zero if I don't have zero? So just being interested in this conversation goes a long line. I know it sounds overly simplified. You're like, oh my God, I want to put a salient tell me to stand on the edge of my horse's bubble. This is crazy. But it's effective. It's effective. <laughs> it's really, really, really effective. There's so much juicy stuff to learn about that's fascinating and the horse feels like you're really making an effort not just to get them to do it but to understand them and ultimately what we want horses to be able to do is say you know i don't really like this thing but i like you and you're cute and i'm going to keep you around so okay i'll do it right ultimately we want the horse to be able to step up to the activity and they don't have to love the activity, but we want them to be able to step into it. And they only can do that if we're willing to explore the slower conversations on the edge of the bubble. Because by the time we're in there and we're grooming, we, 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 we lost it. So gr grooming is the last thing for them. They have a greeting ritual, and then they have a defining space ritual, and then they have a movement ritual. And then if everything went well, they relax and they begin a grooming ritual. So they have a system that they go through. So that's the best I can do right the now. The short answer. The short answer. Karen, so Karen's like, that's I, I, and Sharon, don't shut up. So yeah. So, so you know, if, if I'm planning on going riding tomorrow, mm -hmm. I might plan on not going riding, just seeing how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And it might result in not riding, not putting the saddle on. It's like just see building, how it goes. Taking some a little extra time to just build a rapport. More rapport and also the green lights. So therefore, in the long run, you won't have to have these in-depth conversations anymore. You're just gonna take this time right now, be like, wow, this is interesting. I'm gonna explore this with you and see if I can help you be happier about the situation because I love riding you and I want you to be loving it too. And so let's just like, how can we figure this out so we can do this activity together and have a nice time? Cause it's a relationship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, and yeah. I get that the only, I guess the only thing that concerns me and, and that's the end of my question is, you know, if, if I'm trying and she's not receptive and she's walling me off and it's like ears back and you know swishing her tail or kicking and then i say all right i guess it's not a good time to do this am i letting her get away with it so that the next day when i try she figures well if i twitch my ear and swish my tail we don't have to do this that that's my only concern that is a really good question. A question and that's the that that's the first time that, when we hear something like that our first, and I hope this is what you're gonna say, is pain. Is there pain somewhere? Mm -hmm. Because having those consistent reactions that are kind of on the larger side, more of the X postures, stomping, the swishing, and the throwing the Or head a memory up. of pain. Yeah. It's not always current pain. Sometimes it's memory. But the, the question that she's asking is, is the horse getting away with it? Right. And that's right. the old model. That's an, there's an old model that we have, the horse culture has, of horses as vehicle. And the horse has to be my vehicle, so it doesn't matter what he's feeling, he just needs to do his job. But right. in the new model, horse is companion animal. We don't have horses because we need them, we have them because we like them. Right. Right, so in the new model, 
horse says vehicle, do it or do what I say or else, or you know, you're not going to get away with that. All this kind of concept doesn't fit the model of relationship. So <laughs> simply put, they're not looking to get out of work. That is that they actually appreciate having a job. They appreciate connection with people. They like pleasing us. They like to please each other. They're social creatures. They want to get along. So when you take the time to say, how can I support you in feeling good about doing this activity? And what are the steps I would take? So what you want, what I want you to do is write down a list of steps you think you could take and make, a, make like a ladder of success and say, well, today I'm going to work on this ladder of success and see what that does. And then you'll learn something. And then tomorrow you say, wow, I did these three things and these three things had some good stuff. But then this fourth thing I thought would work didn't work at all. How interesting. Let me revise my steps. So, you know, and I tried to do this, this fifth thing and I realized I couldn't do that fifth thing because it wasn't prepared. Holy cow, I have to go back and prepare in this other way that I didn't realize I needed to do. So it, when we write things down and we make a list of things I need to do in order, you know, like if you're, if you're getting your license renewed at the DMV, there's a list of things you need to do, right? So if there's a list of things you need to do to support the horse in making better choices, that also includes holding space for the horse as they feel feelings that are uncomfortable, okay? So if horses have memory of pain, like you've had the saddle fit, you've had a vet check, you've had everything, so then memory of pain is, is just as worrisome for them. One time I put that saddle on and it hurt so bad and now, you know, I'm afraid of it. Okay. So they don't know it's a new saddle that was fit to their back or just because you rode them a few times and it felt good. That doesn't mean the memory of pain went away. That just means it's suspended. Mm -hmm. So really, if the interest is, what is it that I need to do with myself that makes me a good partner for my horse? That's really a better set of questioning. Does mm -hmm. that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I have the book. Oh, so, good. <laughs> yeah, I will be referencing it. Thank you very much. I appreciate You're welcome. it. All right. There's a, um, there's a couple Daniel? questions real quick. So first, um, I'll just go with the last one real quick because it is kind of related or it is related to um, Judy's point. So, so Caroline asks, hi, Judy, uh, Sharon, uh, and Laura. Would would testing for Lyme eliminate some of the health issues um, or health ideas um, hidden pain for a long time? So mm. if, if Lyme disease could be a, a cause of some of the pain, possibly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really a good idea to get your, if you have chronic complaints like that, it's a great idea to get. Or even tested. allergies. Yeah, we we met someone in Minnesota. The poor horse was allergic to everything. everything. Leather, wool. And most synthetic things. I mean, it was yeah. just crazy. And, and so he was like, don't even don't touch, touch me. me. <laughs> she had to get this very special. And she is a veterinarian. So, yeah. um, you know, she had to get this very special kind of stuff for him to wear because he was basically breaking out in hives. But they were low, low lying hives, not like the big blotchy hives. But he was allergic to everything. And so mm -hmm. she had to treat him. And then all that stuff went away. So some it, it, very good point. Sometimes these things are hidden in plain sight. I was going to say vitamin E can also be a big one for muscle pain issues. And that's really common vitamin E deficiencies. Right. Excellent. So what I have experienced is horses who, like I worked at a, at a lot of rescues and I, I worked with a lot of horses who had by every, by every right probably should never be ridden again. And yet people are like, but I want him, I, my new pony, I'm going to ride him. And so my job was to help uh, this horse adapt, you know, and, and be somewhat rideable. And some of these horses, you know, had so many uh, issues. But what I experienced was if you could do this kind of um, let me be there for you, let me hold your hand through it. I'm here for you. And, and it got rid of the mindset of the horse is getting away with it, the horse is going to get out of work, all that kind of stuff. These horses, even horses who had chronic arthritis and things, were saying, get on me. Get on me because I trust this relationship. So a lot of them were able to work through discomforts. 
and and you know to have something even just a walking ride in fact my own horse zeke who was this old man and and riddled with arthritis and he had mouth cancer and okay i'm like you're retired no one needs to ride you know you worked hard your whole life and he he had the run of the land and we put a saddle out one day uh because i was going to ride one of my horses and he's loose on the land he comes and puts his nose on the saddle and i'm like yeah zeke that's that's the saddle yeah i'm being you know i'm thinking he's being cute and i turn around and he's lying down on the ground under the saddle and i'm like oh are you colicking and he stands back up and puts his nose on the saddle i'm like okay fine mm -hmm. and he's like gimpy arthritis everywhere cancer in his mouth he's like i don't care i like you get on so that was you know that's that's testimony to that yeah wow All right um one another quick question so are you going to be coming to new york anytime soon i know with COVID kind of puts a damper on some things but are there any future plans possibly in the making of you coming to new york must be nice. We do have some connections there. Um, you know, we want to go up back up north I, to see we, Karen. We know someone. And also <laughs> um, is some banter about perhaps going to Long Island, but we have nothing on the books right now due to the unfortunate lack because, of travel and whatever's going on. Right. But I would world. love to. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're in Vermont, so you know, we're basically next door ish depending on where the barn is in new york it's a very big state actually i'm lying we do have one thing um we're going to the um naples new york but um mountain horse farm there i'm not sure what the status is currently about who's registered or what have you but it's a nice intimate setting where we're not actually doing too many small venues like that mm -hmm. i think we only have uh, six or eight people in that clinic um and it's three days yeah. it's been so a while since i've actually looked at the calendar but right. but um, i would love yeah. karen i would love to come up and see you again and yeah so if we could set yes that up, that's great, great. Mm -hmm. yeah all, all right. right and then dan you had a a quick question right yeah About so as of january you'll have three books out in print mm-hmm I need to get all three or can I just get the one that comes out in January and I'll know what you talked about in the other two? And yes, I know that means less money in your pocket. <laughs> well, <good>. yes. <laughs> so you can do whatever you want. Um, the book that I wrote for January includes enough preliminary information to that, you know, you should be able to catch on. But um the first book is really like a, a ground a groundwork of the basic language and the second book they're actually calling it the dictionary so you're, you're going from like c spot run to like shakespeare is you know kind of <laughs> the, 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 the third book is like and you could say it like this and like that and like that and if you're like this and he's like that and you could do this and you could do blah, 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 blah. and the first book is like here's a o <laughs> really goes into it is lot. smart he can handle Shakespeare all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh goes it's like the e the horse speak the equine human translation guide so it's like a lot of how the herds are talking to each other mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then how we can then do a little bit of thing with them but yeah the third book's going to be a lot of it's really human strong um, yeah tasks and ideas and things and then the second book's all stories so that's fun you know, depending on your learning style, you know, Sharon is a very visual writer. So she, you're like, when you're reading, you're actually seeing the pictures. So a lot of folks have learned a lot of horse speak through that as well. To the second book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like all three. <laughs> One, you it's know, worth you it, Dan. It's worth it. For the DVD to get you a good, you know, two hours. That's of true. A, you know, the DVD is called First Conversations and it goes over the the basic four G's and, and just beginning, it goes over the buttons and it's three horses that I had never met before in stalls. And I'm, so I'm starting at the edge of the bubble, working my way in, having a greeting ritual, and then finally taking them out and beginning the first navigation cycle of communication. And the last horse of the day um, was a rescue and she was really high headed and nervous. And they had said, you can, you know, you can take her out and stuff, but don't take her into the arena because she loses her mind. So that's what I did is I took her into the arena for the end of the day. And and she actually just gives me a hug. So it's really a nice ending, but that's my plug for that. <laughs> 
it was my it was a warm moment for me i was like she's hugging oh. me <laughs> hey you know sounds good thank you all right all right does anyone else have any questions you have one you missed somebody mhm was asking will the recording of this session be available online yep. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, good. We can post it. What well, website? I assume. Um, yes. <laughs> yep. All right. Any other substantive questions for Sharon oh. and Laura? Well, I don't think we can take too much more of their time. Mm -hmm. I feel oh, they, no, they've no, already no. given more than their share. I we think. One, one Go ahead. Oh, Dan's got a Where thing. Go ahead, Dan. Where do I get the? Oh, so the Kristen said the horse personalities weren't in the first book how do we do things differently for different horses that's that true such a great question mm -hmm. and we do go over that in the third book a little bit <laughs> and there is a webinar on horse personalities um where it does describe the uh, multiple different personalities not multiple and personality just different it can be <laughs> it can be different <laughs> ones and different energy types you know but yeah, we, yeah, it's not a psychosocial dynamic. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that when you understand what the horse personality is that you that you think you have, and what is their energy type, then you can adjust how you're communicating. So you don't talk to a 13 year old boy the way you talk to the mayor of a town, right? You 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 speak differently depending on who you're addressing. So if you have a horse who is, you know, the, the equivalency of a 13 year old boy who's like, I can open this door and that door and this door and watch me play ball. Woo, I'm gonna eat all the dog food. And that's who you have. You're, you're gonna do things. You're gonna yeah. work with that horse differently than a horse who shows up and is like, I'm the king, nice to meet you. You know, like it's just a totally different uh, way of communicating. It's still horse speak. It's the same system but but who you're addressing kind of changes the tonality and it's a lot with a joker there's a lot more of holding the bubble of personal space a little more go away face sometimes the jokers have a broken go away face button we would say and so it's constant you might have to do it like 200 times you're like yeah and i actually mean it and leaving the hold hand up you stay over there this is my space your space, your space my space your space my yeah, space your, and they're like is. why <laughs> so yeah and so it's really the the big thing is like the X and O modulation between each different personality type. And like Sharon said, it's like how you talk to other people is similarly how you do end up engaging with the horses, mm -hmm. depending on their personality. Yeah. Thank so that's you. something to think about because then it's it's not just, um, and, and it, it can help you to to modify the the training agenda that you have as well, because if you're, if you've got you know a mother horse who's used to being a mom and used to calling the shots and used to i know how to keep everyone sound i'm good and you know but then you're like no i really want to do it this way and she's like but that's stupid <laughs> 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 then you know you, what are you going to do take her dignity away because you know she's she's like you're silly and you don't know what you're talking about and you, maybe you don't know what you're talking about so you know and i've had, i've met mares who were right and i was like darn it <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. You can go. Well, I think Sarah, could we share the? I, I was just looking. I'm going to interrupt the questions about like where to find the books and things like yeah. that. Could we possibly either put those links on the website for the Horse Council for a bit, just so that if people, especially when we share the link for the for this webinar, if then people can find those things to help them get to these resources to learn more. Because, like I said, for me. This was I this just opened up a whole new level of conversation with horses for me. And I have been driven to to find more and share more because I think horses are happier and people are safer when horses are happier. So what happened to Joanne? Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. And I have to say, coming up to work with you and your horses was like just such a crowning moment for me as well. And being there that one summer when the magic Little happened. Vinny. Oh, Vinny. I got to send you guys a picture of Vinny. He's totes adorbs. So I bet. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. All right, that guys. Was, and that cool was thing. honestly like, so cool to be there yeah. in the moments of yeah. him hitting the ground and like the first, very first, first conversations. conversations. Yeah. Learned a lot.
Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thanks, Jared and Laura. Thank you very oh, much. Great. Thank you. Be well. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. It was wonderful. You guys are great. I Thanks. can't wait to go out to the barn in the morning. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Good. Have fun. Excellent. Thank you so much, folks. Take care. Be well. Good night, guys. Thank Good night. you. Karen, great sparkle. Thank you. Thank you. I finally brought it out, right? Yeah, you, you sparkled. You're looking good, Karen. Very good. Uh, very, very informative. So very good idea. Uh, yeah, for thank us you. To show. Judy, I had a